Did they ask you what you were doing, taking mommy out, or? What they what they say specifically? It was more of like, you know, what are you doing to mommy? Yeah. She said no, daddy. That's the last thing she said. While we think we've seen the worst there is to see where familicide is concerned, we're constantly left in shock when more stories surface. Today, we'll be looking at the story of a man who murdered his whole family. And for what, you might ask? Well, keep watching to find out. Welcome, or welcome back, to Crime Origin. My name is Zach, and today, we'll be looking at the case of Chris Watts. Christopher Lee Watts was born on May 16, 1985 in Fayetteville, North Carolina, to parents Ronnie and Cindy Watts. As is becoming increasingly common with parents of mass murderers, Ronnie and Cindy weren't the best role models, even as parents. It was said that Ronnie had an addiction to a substance, which many people suspected to be cocaine, at some point in his life. After learning of this, Chris took it upon himself to talk his father out of taking those substances, specifically by reminding him constantly that they would have physical effects on him. Addiction aside, there was also a lack of trust between Chris's parents, as Chris's mother, Cindy, at some point firmly believed that her husband was in an affair. She noticed that small amounts of money went missing from the house from time to time, and when she confronted Ronnie for the receipts of what he was actually spending on, he couldn't offer any, so she presumed he was spending on another woman. This, of course, created some disagreements in the house, and Chris had to grow up in such a toxic environment. Ronnie and Cindy's personal issues aside, Chris had a somewhat stable life as a child, and although there weren't any records of his educational history, there were records about his life after that, with one being his marriage to Shannon, whom he met in 2010 on Facebook. In 2012, two years after their initial meeting, the two got married in Mecklenburg County. As it turned out, Chris's mother, Cindy, wasn't on good terms with Shannon, and as such, she and her husband, Ronnie, weren't present at the wedding. According to Cindy, she never liked Shannon because of the way she treated her lover, Chris. In fact, in the doting mother's opinion, Chris deserved someone better. After their wedding, the young couple developed a habit of traveling around and visiting new locations together. One time in 2013, Chris and Shannon went on a trip to Frederick, Colorado. During their journey, they saw a house of five bedrooms and decided to purchase it. Shortly after that, on December 17th, the couple welcomed their first baby girl, Bella Marie Watts. Two years later, on July 17th, they had their second child, Celeste Catherine Watts, who was fondly called Cece. Sadly, things took a different turn after the birth of Cece, as the family declared bankruptcy due to outstanding debts, from car payments and medical bills to student loans and debt on credit cards. At the time, Chris had a job at Andarco Petroleum and had been working there for about six months, earning about $61,500 every year. Shannon, on the other hand, worked at the call center for a children's hospital, where she earned $18 an hour. With all of these put together, the couple's joint check account held a sum of about $864. Meanwhile, Shannon later got employed by a marketing company, Lavelle, to work as a remote marketer. During this time, the couple made conscious efforts and careful decisions that would improve the standard of living of the family up until June 2018, when Chris met his mistress, Nicole Kessinger. According to Chris, his affair made him forget he was a family man, and so he didn't feel pressured to do anything. With Shannon around, Chris had to be sneaky about the relationship, but the times when Shannon and the kids were away, Chris and Nicole spent almost every night. It didn't take long for Shannon to begin to suspect that Chris was having an affair. On August 6, 2018, Chris and Shannon had been talking about the arrival of their third child, as Shannon had revealed prior to that time that she was pregnant. Chris had told Shannon that he wasn't ready for them to have a third child, and that he was fine if they had just Bella and Celeste. The following day, Shannon texted a close friend telling her about the conversation she had with Chris, and that she was scared their marriage wasn't going to work because Chris had started behaving unlike himself. According to Shannon, Chris stopped touching her and only spoke to her whenever she was trying to find out if anything was wrong. A few days later, Shannon went away on a business trip to Arizona with Nicole Atkinson, 
her close friend and co-worker. On August 13th, at about 2 a.m., Nicole drove Shannon to her home in Frederick, Colorado. According to Nicole, Shannon seemed very disturbed all the while they were on the trip as she barely ate or drank anything of her own volition. Later that morning, Shannon confronted Chris, asking him if he was having an affair. Chris told her he wasn't cheating on her, but that their marriage was failing and that he wasn't sure he still loved her. Shannon, who then got furious as a result of Chris's reply, threatened that if their marriage ended, Chris would never get to see their daughters again. As reports would have it, Shannon's threat irked Chris so much that he angrily strangled her while she lay on the bed. Just at that time, their first daughter, Bella, walked in and saw her mother lying lifeless. As you would expect of any innocent and curious child, she wanted to know what was going on, so she asked her dad if her mom was okay. Chris lied, telling her that her mom just wasn't feeling very well. Almost immediately, Chris used a sheet to wrap up Shannon's body and began to drag her to his truck. With Bella crying and following her father, when Chris got to the truck, he placed Shannon's body in the back along with Bella and Celeste. He drove all three of them to an oil site at Andarco Petroleum where he worked, and there he murdered his two daughters by smothering them with a blanket. While Chris was killing each member of his family, Nicole, who went on a business trip with Shannon, had been trying to reach her to see if she had started to feel better. Nicole, however, wasn't getting through to Shannon. Later on, she found out that Shannon had even missed her doctor's appointment for that day, and so she began to worry because Shannon had never missed her doctor's appointments before. Not knowing what to do, Nicole called Chris, telling him that she had been trying to reach Shannon but her efforts had all been abortive. In response to this, Chris told Nicole that he had left his wife and kids in the house as he left for work that morning, and that when he came back home, he didn't find anyone in the house, not Shannon, not the kids. Nicole had also gone into their house, but still, there was no answer. She then decided to call the police so they could run some wellness checks. The police found Shannon's belongings, including her car, all intact. Her phone was found in between some couch cushions, and a suitcase was found downstairs, but there were no signs of criminality. The Frederick police then reached out to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and also to the FBI for help. They also appealed to the public to help find Shannon and her daughters. After 24 hours, an endangered missing person alarm was issued by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, declaring Shannon and her daughters officially missing. Shannon, Shannon, Bella, Bella, Bella Celeste, Celeste, if you're out there, just, there, there, just, just come back. Come back, like, come back. If somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with, without anybody here. Please bring her back. When the police asked Chris if he had any idea where his wife would probably have gone with the children, he said he didn't. He told the public that he was fast asleep when Shannon came in that morning at 2 a.m., and then the next morning, he had to leave for work. He also said that he had sent a couple of messages to her that morning, which she didn't reply, so he concluded that she was probably busy. To keep up with his pretense, Chris went further to implore the community to help him find his family. When the police further questioned him, asking if they had any argument at all prior to her supposed departure, Chris said that they indeed had some form of emotional conversation. He, however, did not tell the police that he had not been spending time with his family as he ought to, that he and his wife spent more than a month apart during summer that year, and that he had hinted that he wanted a separation, after which she threatened him that he wouldn't be able to see their daughters again if they separated. On the other hand, Chris had also texted his mistress, Nicole, the day his wife and daughters went missing. Chris told her in a text that he wanted to see her, and since they both worked together, she went to him. According to her, there was nothing odd about him while they talked, not until he texted her about 3.45 p.m., saying his wife and daughters were gone, not appearing bothered by it. He had told Nicole that Shannon had taken their daughters out to play date, but never came back. According to Nicole, Chris never mentioned that Shannon was pregnant with their third child while they were having an affair, and so when she found out from the news, she was shocked. 
One thing led to another, and Nicole told Chris that she'd rather they didn't talk to each other again until Shannon and their daughters were found. On August 15th, literally a day after, Nicole contacted the police to inform them that she had been in a relationship with Chris, knowing he was married. Investigators then looked through Chris's phone conversations and found out she wasn't lying. The police then linked Nicole through the FBI, and after some hours, Chris was arrested and fired from his job simultaneously. After Chris's arrest, he promised he would confess the whole truth on the condition that he would be allowed to speak to his father first. He was permitted to, and so he told his father all that he did, including where the bodies were. The next day, authorities found the bodies of Shannon and the kids. Shannon's body was found approximately 40 miles east from their house, buried inside a grave at a site that was owned by Chris's last employer. The bodies of Bella and Cece were found in takes for crude oil. Their bodies had been there for about four days. On August 21st, Chris was charged with familicide, first degree murder on five counts. Five counts because his children were minors, so there were additional counts. And one count of illegal pregnancy termination. He was also charged with tampering with deceased bodies on three counts. With all of these counts, he was denied bail in court and a chance of parole. That day in court, Chris did not plead guilty to the charges against him. The only admission he made was that he killed Shannon out of anger and then disposed of her body and that of their daughters after Shannon had killed them. He told the police that he had told Shannon he wanted a divorce, but she got mad and decided to kill their daughters. Chris said that he saw Bella already dead from the screen of the baby monitor and that Shannon was strangling Celeste. He then ran up to the room and also strangled Shannon to death. The investigators, however, did not believe this side of Chris's story. Regardless, Chris refused to enter a plea until November after about three months. Because it took Chris a while to plead guilty, people wondered why he eventually did. According to Chris, he had to take the plea because there was already so much evidence against him and that whatever he had to say wouldn't be able to save him either. He further revealed that he didn't have a choice, especially taking the evidence against him into consideration. Chris was given five life sentences for the killings, three of which were to run consecutively, while the other two were to run concurrently. He was also sentenced to 84 years in prison for related crimes. In December 2018, Chris was transferred to another prison in Wisconsin to ensure maximum security. Right now, Chris is still serving out his sentences, and it seems like he will be doing that for the rest of his life. Thanks for tuning in to Crime Origin. If you want to learn more about the most notorious killers to have ever lived, then you should check out one of the videos on your screen. Thank you for watching.